joined by our hospital leaders. We can't look forward without taking a brief look at where we've been and where we are now. Some more on those numbers. Looking back today, hard to believe two years ago on February 2nd, 2020, there were still no confirmed cases of COVID-19 in New York. 12 samples were being tested at that time. Now let's flash forward to 2021. A statewide positivity rate of nearly five and a half percent, more than 8,000 people in the hospital. And now we arrive to today, the numbers very similar, a positivity rate of 5.3 percent, 6,600, excuse me, hospitalizations. The state also noting this week we have seen a 92 percent drop in COVID-19 cases from the January 7th peak, a 43 percent drop in statewide hospitalizations. So what do those numbers mean for the big picture in the fight against COVID? The expert panel before us tonight has been on the front lines of this pandemic, knows firsthand the impact right here in the capital region. That's right. So let's introduce you to our team of hospital leaders right here. And I want to ask all of you as I call your name to please raise your hand. That way our audience at home can put a face with that name. So let's start from Albany Medical Center. We have president and CEO Dr. Dennis McKenna. Also, Dr. Thea Delfino, Chief Medical Officer for St. Peter's Health Partners Acute Care. Also joining us from the western part of the region, we have Dr. William Mayer, Chief Medical Officer of St. Mary's Healthcare in Amsterdam, and Nathan Littowers, Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Frederick Goldberg. And from north of Albany, we have Dr. David Mastriani, Senior Vice President of the Saratoga Hospital Medical Group. And then we go to Glens Falls Hospital's co-director of the intensive care unit, Dr. Jeffrey Sir Filippi. Dr. David Liebers from Ellis Medicine was also supposed to be a part of this expert panel, but regrettably will not be able to make it tonight. And if COVID has taught us anything, it's still roll with the punches, of course. So we want to thank you all for being here tonight on this important night. Let's jump right in. Okay, Dr. Delfino, as the chief medical officer for one of the biggest hospitals in our region, let's move past the fears. Let's settle into reality. Take us inside of your ER. Do you have what you need? Are we in a better or worse position than we were in 2020? Tough question, but what are your thoughts? Thanks, Paul. So the pandemic has fundamentally changed the healthcare landscape and stressed our hospitals in ways that we have never seen before. Um, necessity is the mother of invention, and I'm sure you'll hear tonight about the creative ways that we are dealing with these challenges. So to get to your question of what's it look like in our emergency departments, well, as far as supplies in the ED are concerned, such as masks, gloves, gowns, we are in a far better place today than we were two years ago. However, we continue to experience supply chain uh, disruptions, and the most important of which right now is a blood shortage that is affecting the entire United States. Um, we are transfusing patients judiciously and watching very closely our supply of blood products. One of our other biggest challenges in the EDs is a nursing shortage. Um, and it's not just in our emergency departments, it's in our hospitals, our continuing care facilities, and our offices. We are using more contract labor than um, we ever have. And it's expected that by 2030, New York State will be short by approximately 60,000 nurses. But I do wanna add that it's not all bad. Um, we've had some absolutely wonderful changes in our emergency departments. Now patients are able to get a primary care appointment when they come to our EDs. We have telehealth, we're infusing monoclonal antibody. Um, and I just have to give a shout out to all of our emergency department providers and nurses who are on the front lines every day. And I am just in awe of the care and compassion they continue to provide despite all of these challenges. Dr. Delfino, such important insight. Thank you for answering that. Let's keep the conversation moving along right now. Dr. Dennis McKenna, this question uh, from Albany Med on the at the app onset, the capacity here was the biggest concern for the elderly, especially the immunocompromised. Now a new PSA from the Department of Health says that there is an alarming number of child hospitalizations from the Omicron variant. What has Albany Med been seeing in recent hospital hospitalization trends? Can you speak to that? 
Absolutely, and uh, good evening to all of you. Thank you for this opportunity and uh, welcome to all of my Capital District colleagues for this really important conversation. Let me begin by saying I agree with everything that uh, Dr. Delfino said. And one thing which I'd like to add is that the world that we're seeing today is far different than it was two years ago as far as patients presenting to our emergency departments. If we look at the, the patients in early 2020 who presented, about 50% of those patients would land in an ICU. And today those numbers are significantly lower than they were before. On the supply end, I completely agree that the PPE and the masks and the gowns are more readily available. And so are the testing availabilities in our emergency department, which makes it so much easier for all of us to treat patients uh, when we can diagnose them quickly in the ER. And staffing, I know we're gonna talk about as well, and we're all trying to make some, some ground there. As far as pediatrics go, what I can tell you is that we have seen some admissions to the hospital recently for pediatrics, but our numbers continue to be quite low. They represent really a small fraction of the admissions to the hospital. By and large, when the children come in, they're treated and they're discharged within a couple days. We are seeing children sometimes end up in our pediatric ICU. By and large, they tend to be children who have underlying medical conditions or who are more at risk. So when you think about COVID, we always have to remind ourselves that there are populations that are vulnerable to getting the virus and actually to having the worst uh, impact from that. And that is in both extremes of age. And with the younger population, the children who are most sick, unfortunately tend to be the ones who have the underlying medical conditions. But by and large, I'd say the numbers are quite small and not something that is alarming us in any way. Encouraging news there. Thank you, doctor. I want to shift the conversation now to Dr. Mastriani with the Saratoga Hospital Group. And doctor, overloaded hospital emergency rooms lead to diversions when patients either have to be transferred or have to be sent elsewhere. Uh, let's go back to before COVID. How common or uncommon was an overloaded ER in those pre-COVID-19 days? Well, at least for our ER, it could be busy, but um, we did not see the stress that we've seen over the last two years. I agree with Dr. Delfino and uh, certainly Dr. McKenna being an emergency room doctor is an expert in this. But uh, if you also go back to those two years ago, what we saw there was a real influx of incredibly ill patients at a time when the ER staff did not know what they were facing. We didn't understand the illness and we didn't have the vaccine. And what I saw there as a non-ER physician was one of the most memorable and probably inspiring things I've ever seen in healthcare. It was the creativity Dr. Delfino talked about. It was the determination of the healthcare workers. And it made me extremely proud, whether it was the doctors, the nurses, the uh, first responders, the people cleaning the room, the check-in folks, public safety. I mean, these people were facing an illness that um, they were afraid they were gonna bring home to their family. They were gonna afraid, afraid it was gonna affect them. And that set the tone for what the healthcare workers um, have accomplished really across um, the whole pandemic. I'm just very proud. But to answer your direct question, um, when ERs are full, it really can be from a number of reasons. It can be more sick people. And certainly we're seeing that whether it's COVID or people who can't get regular medical care. It can also be that the work in the ER is harder. Now you have to put on your mask, you have to put on your gown, you have to clean the room, you have to decontaminate everything. And on the other side, it's harder to get patients out of the ER because the hospitals are full, the nursing homes are full, they can't go back to their residential facilities as easily. So the whole system is really clogged from one end to the other. I don't think there's any easy answer. I'll be interested to hear what everybody else has to say. The basic principle is cooperation. And I think the hospitals in this region have cooperated beautifully. I'm incredibly proud of the fact that early in the pandemic, we reached outside the region and under Dr. McKenna's guidance, took patients from New York to help them. What I would say the answer is not though, is if you're listening to this, if you're sick and you need us, please come, don't stay home. That's not the message we want to give. Our ERs are open and we're here to take care of you. Good advice there. Thank you, doctor. This next question for Dr. Sir Philippi, you are the co-director of the intensive care unit at Glens Falls Hospital. How quickly now would an ICU potentially get overwhelmed in this scenario? Well, early on, uh, 
we were all very concerned we were going to get overwhelmed. And we had numerous meetings in place about how we were going to staff the ICU. And even staff units outside the ICU where critical patients uh, would be. Uh, thank God we, that didn't happen, but we did have meetings to address that potential. Uh, currently, uh, our ICU is certainly not overwhelmed, but as staffing becomes more of an issue, uh, each day is a, a trying day. And I, I, I noticed that you know, this meeting is taking place on Groundhog Day, and it reminded me some days of walking in the intensive care unit, and it sort of feels like Groundhog Day. It, uh, every day you are faced with similar challenges. Uh, the landscape is changing, hopefully better soon. Uh, but these challenges challenges uh, are, are a daily event, and uh, we do, uh, everybody sort of works together as a team, and the staffing issues uh, are coming into play. But I think overall, as a team, our, our ICUs are, are well manned uh, and, and ready to uh, handle uh, the current problem. All right, thank you, doctor, for answering that question. Dr. Mayor, Dr. Goldberg, let's bring you into this conversation. This question for both of you. St. Mary's and Nathan Latower were on the most recent list of high-risk region hospitals notified to cease non-urgent elective surgeries. So our question is this, is that an accurate reflection of your facilities right now? Dr. Mayor, uh, you can start off with answering this question, and then Dr. Goldberg, we'd love to hear from you. Sure, thank you. And again, thank you for inviting us tonight to uh, speak on what's happening in each of our local regions. Also, I wanted to uh, give a thanks to the leadership at Albany Medical Center for setting up very early on in the month of March 2020, a collaboration between all the chief medical officers and other staff members. And initially, we were meeting uh, virtually uh, on a daily basis to try to help us understand what was going on. And that those meetings continue even to today not on a daily basis, but we continue to meet weekly and sometimes more frequently than that. And that's been extremely helpful in our efforts, uh, somewhat unprecedented across the state, I, I believe. Um, yeah, so as and many of you know out there that uh, if you've had any planned surgery during this past two years, you may know that it may have been postponed or canceled or uh, there's been a kind of a stop and go that's been going on based on our capacity to take care of these uh, more elective and non-urgent types of surgeries. Uh, so uh, right now we are experiencing uh, in our region, in the western part of the, the uh, region, um, a high level of inpatient capacity. The, the state health department has a, a way of calculating and assessing on pretty much a weekly basis what uh, health systems around the capital region and throughout the state would be on a list of which hospitals have the capacity to go ahead and do uh, more elective type cases and which ones may not. Um, so uh, the good news is that um, we and all the other regional centers have been still doing all the emergency cases, all the urgent cases, anyone with diagnosis or potential diagnosis of malignancy or cancers and some of those other types of cases that need to be done if someone's in severe pain will continue to uh, do that. And, and a lot of that has to do with the real dedication and commitment of the medical staffs, the nursing staffs and other ancillary staffs we have to help uh, make sure that that happens so that no one is uh, uh, outside of receiving care. Dr. Goldberg, um, we'd love for you to jump in on this question as well. Um, well, to, again, thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's great to uh, be here with uh, my colleagues from the other hospitals because it's been mentioned several times, the collaboration amongst the hospitals in the Capital District has been really inspiring, very helpful. Uh, the whole concept of load balancing, transferring patients from those who don't have capacity to the hospitals that do have capacity um, is something that we spent a lot of time working on. Um, as far as the elective surgeries, uh, you know, as, as Dr. Mayer said, the state uses this formula whereby if you have 10% or less of your staff bed capacity uh, available, they don't want you to do elective surgeries. Um, 
Now, St. Mary's and Nathan Littower, according to the state, are in the Mohawk Valley region. And so the formulas that are used for that region uh, would indicate that there's less than 10% capacity. And so there have been times at which we were asked not to do elective surgeries. Uh, again, like the other hospitals, patients who can't wait, and it doesn't have to be an emergency, it's cancer surveillance, it's intractable pain or suffering. Uh, our, our surgeons have conversations with the patients and when surgeon and patients both feel that the surgery is not postponable, then they are scheduled. Uh, as far as, you know, as a small rural community hospital, we don't do as much inpatient surgery. Uh, most of our surgeries are outpatient. So uh, the majority of our patients don't need an inpatient bed. I believe the, the governor um, is using these formulas in part on the premise that the OR staff, if we don't have scheduled surgeries, can be uh, <clears throat> transfixed to work as nurses on other inpatient units and emergency rooms. And, those skill sets are very specific, uh, very unique, and not necessarily transferable. So uh, the premise on which that is based doesn't always pan out. All right, thank you so much, Dr. Goldberg. Uh, next question here pertaining to, you know, treatments. And, and back in April of 2020, when cases were on the rise, capacity at the forefront, there was this dreadful feeling of if you go to the hospital, you might not come out. Dr. Mastriani kind of alluded to that with his advice saying, if you are not feeling well, seek treatment. So Dr. McKenna, this question's for you. And do you still feel like there's uncertainty about going to the hospital and seeking that treatment if you're not feeling well? That's a great question. And uh, let me just begin by uh, saying one thing that has been said by a couple other people, but I think it bears repeating. The collaboration and the coordination in this region is something that I will be proud of for my entire career here. I am certain that because the Albany Med Health System, St. Peter's Health Partners, and our colleagues and friends out to the west at Nathan Littower and St. Mary's Amsterdam work together, lives were saved in this region. And I am so incredibly proud of that. When it comes to therapeutics, again, the world of 2022 is far different than it was in 2020. As I said, back in April of 2020, you had a 50% chance if you landed in the hospital to end up in the ICU. There are so many things that have changed since then. We know, of course, for one, that this variant of the virus is significantly less lethal and less severe. And you have about a 2% chance at this point in the capital region, if you are diagnosed with COVID, of even ending up in the hospital. We're seeing about 5% of all of our patients end up in the ICU. Now, there are still some patients who, quite frankly, are at risk, and those risk factors include age, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, lung disease, renal disease. These patients often can end up in an ICU, but we have treatments now. We have treatments that were not available two years ago. We have antiviral medications such as remdesivir. We have monoclonal antibodies that can be given in an outpatient setting to prevent people from coming in the hospital. We have ventilator management by our critical care doctors like Dr. Sir Flippy that make a difference as far as how these patients are being managed. And the, the survival, survivability of this population now is significantly better than it was two years ago. So obviously we encourage people to be vaccinated. We encourage people to take care of themselves in many different ways. But I think the message to the public is healthcare has evolved very quickly in two years. And the treatments that are being offered in the hospital today are far better than they were even two years ago. A remarkable progress. And it, this is to the group now. i uh, going to start again with you, Dr. McKenna, but then I want to get everybody's kind of reaction to this. We have a poignant viewer question on the prevalence of the virus that came to us from Patrice Holman. Uh, she overheard a nurse say it's not a matter of who will get the virus, but just a matter of when, because in her words, everybody's going to get it. Dr. McKenna, your reaction to that statement? Well, of course, that's an interesting question. We, we know that getting the virus means different things to different people. We know that certain populations that are at risk and I identify those risk factors have a possibility of ending up in the hospital. I think the fact of the matter is, is that with Omicron, what we're finding is that by and large, it's less severe and uh, people are less likely to end up in the hospital. And I think it's a fair statement to say for many people, 
who get the virus these days, this acts and feels a lot like it had been in previous years, looking more like a typical seasonal respiratory virus, maybe even a common cold. And we know a certain percentage of people actually have it and don't even know. So whether or not everyone will get it or not, I don't know. Certainly we know a lot of people were testing positive for it. We see that percent positivity dropping very quickly now, closer to 5%. But the truth of the matter is, is that if you get it, more importantly, the chances are you're not going to be as sick as you were two years ago, and you're probably not going to end up in the hospital. I see a lot of agreeing nods on the panel. Dr. Delfino, I saw you nod as well. Your thoughts? Yeah, I agree completely with Dr. McKenna. Um, I mean, when you look at the numbers, even as of two weeks ago, if you were out in public, um, one in five individuals uh, likely had COVID or um, had uh no symptoms at that time, but it, it's very prevalent. Um, it doesn't mean that everyone will get it, but there's a good chance if you are in public, um, you may get it. And to right, Dr. Dr. McKenna's point, the severity, uh, if you're vaccinated and boosted um, and social distancing, masking, routine hand hygiene, your chances are less likely, but the risk is still there. Yeah, everything that we've been hearing for the last two years. Dr. Sir Filippi, your take on whether at some point everybody will have to uh, deal with this. Well, I told my family that. I said, uh, this one's going to be hard to avoid. Uh, thank God we're doing pretty well. Uh, uh, it, I mean, it's certainly more contagious. And like everyone is saying, it's, it's less uh, lethal. It seems to mostly affect the upper airways, uh, the nose, the throat not so much the lung, thank God. Uh, but in patients who are unvaccinated, we do see some of those patients in the intensive care unit. And we are seeing a large population of patients who actually don't come in for COVID, they come in with a uh, positive test for COVID, but they're there for another reason. And those patients uh, seem to do uh, fairly well, especially if they've been vaccinated, they do quite well but it still can be a problem in the ICU. Now, you have to remember, I'm seeing a very skewed population of patients. I'm seeing that small percentage that end up in an intensive care unit or end up on a ventilator. And so that perspective uh, you know, changes for me. I, I just see the sickness of the sick. Um, and, but I am encouraged by the trends. And, uh, I think everybody here agrees with that. Dr. Mastriani, what would you tell Patrice about will everybody get COVID? Well, I tell her I've been fooled a lot in the last two years, and it's possible that I'll be fooled again. So um, it's really very difficult to know. I would agree with what was said. And I would also add my perspective as a hematologist and oncologist is that there are a certain set of people who are immunocompromised who um, could be very vulnerable to this, even if they've been vaccinated and boosted. And those people need um, protection and they need uh, our support as they seek protection. And so when you see somebody wearing a mask and you see somebody taking precautions, um, you know that may be one of your family members or your friends who's immunocompromised. Respect them, uh, be careful of them, and don't assume uh, that for them, this is a, a trivial infection. It certainly may not be. And I think a little bit of uh, respect to that will go a long way as well. Dr. Mayer, your thoughts? Yeah, I think um, as I mentioned, is there's no doubt that this Omicron is much more contagious. Um, and, but I don't think the, the public should think like, okay, it's just a matter of time because we know, and it's been alluded to, that there are still patients who get COVID-19 and with this Omicron get hospitalized and end up in the care of the ICU. And unfortunately, some of those patients are come and don't survive. And you don't know if you're gonna be one of them. And in addition to that, we also know that there's a group of patients who survive, but they end up having long-term symptoms. And, and, and so forth. So it, it's one of those things that we still should be diligent as much as we can to prevent getting the, the infection as much as possible. So continue to wear the mask, continue to be isolated as much as you can, make good choices about your exposures and, um, and hopefully you won't get it. But there is, there is this propensity out there that people think, well, let's, I'm gonna get it, it's just a matter of time. That and, isn't necessarily completely true. And Dr. Goldberg, your advice and your thoughts. Um, 
you know, the uh, this virus, like any virus, is uh, highly communicable, but this one, uh, even more than chickenpox, which is probably one of the most communicable childhood diseases we've ever seen. We've had experience with vaccines now uh, since the 1950s, if not before, and uh, if it weren't for all the progress we've made with vaccines, uh, we would still be seeing outbreaks of childhood measles and whooping cough. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, in some communities, uh, there have been outbreaks of those diseases when immunization rates uh, lag behind. Um, the more contagious than Delta, uh, which Delta was considered to be as contagious as chickenpox. Uh, will everybody get it? You know, I don't think we know the answer to that, um, but whether you're asymptomatic or have a very mild upper respiratory infection, if you get within six feet of someone who has comorbidities, um, the elderly, the diabetics, the obese, the people with heart and lung disease or kidney disease, um, it could be a life-threatening, if not a fatal infection for them. So I think we all have a responsibility to maintain our vigilance. Great advice there. All right, so much more to come. Fascinating conversation. We are back in 60 seconds. We're going to dig into more of your viewer questions. But first, a salute to all of the frontline healthcare workers out there. We'll be right back.